Uh, and for those of you that uh, don't understand that presidents use all opportunities for shameless self-promotion, um, one of the reasons I'm late is kind of running through lateness all the way afternoon because I understand that we're not so narcissistic that we'd be drawn by ratings, um, but we are. Uh, and the Business Week undergraduate ratings came out uh, this afternoon. Um, and so for the first time in our history as an institution, we're now a top 25 business school in the world. Um, <laughs> So I figured that entitles me to be a few minutes late. I mean, no doubt due to the extraordinary leadership that the institution's been under for the last year. But in fact, the, the questionnaires were collected before I got here. But there's no question given the positive nature of the results, I will claim all of the credit. But celebrate, quite honestly, the institution continuing to get um, the recognition that it so justly deserves. Uh, but enough about me and enough about Babson. We're here to celebrate the Babson Olin Wellesley course tonight. And we're also here to uh, spend some time uh, with another uh, really good friend and an extraordinary uh, manager slash leader, uh, Jeff Swartz. And many of you have had the opportunity uh, to read about him and interact with a variety of different published forums and web-based forums to understand that on most of the fundamental dimensions of what has classically uh, been defined as corporate social responsibility, whether it relates to issues of volunteerism, issues of employment, issues of diversity, issues of community relations, issues of environmental sensitivity, uh, issues of global responsibility and sourcing. Um, this is a leader and this is a company that has absolutely walked the talk right? in every way, shape, or form. There are lots of people who are capable of giving marvelous speeches uh, about these issues and can point to one or two anecdotes where they might have a successful best practices project that they can relate to, okay? Uh, but this permeates all of, uh, of what is Timberland. Um, he also obviously is the third generation in a family business, so for those of you um, who understand uh, the old allegory about the number of generations that a family business can actually withstand, uh, before it's either demise or blissful success, uh, you begin to understand some of the tensions about managing a family business, managing a public company, and managing a company that explicitly is orienting itself to multiple bottom lines, not as a theoretical prospect, uh, but as a practical proposition. And as a practical proposition within the context of a world uh, which is not benign uh, and not extraordinarily supportive. I mean, this is, as I affectionately say, as someone, uh, uh, as someone who has moved out of the retail world and actually knew uh, Jeff quite well, not only as a friend, but as one of our directors at Limited Brands, um, I'm quite fond of regularly being able to say to people that it's a good time to not be a retailer. Yeah. You know, he is one. Yeah. And a wholesaler, okay? Uh, you know, and I spent a little bit of time describing what it was like to be a college president, and he didn't like that idea either, okay? <laughs> Uh, and so the question really becomes one of what do we do in this environment, okay, which is clearly not a benign environment, that really threatens the viability and continued existence of multiple brands in a variety of different settings, um, and certainly challenges the basic proposition of doing well and doing good, at least over the short run. So I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to introduce Jeff as someone who really does do it, um, he'll give an, uh, an open community address, but I've also encouraged him, as we've done in the past, to make sure that he leaves ample time for a Q&A uh, within this group before we break uh, for class um, that will follow around uh, 7.15 or so. So, um, so let me turn it over to Jeff with sincere appreciation that with all that's going on in the world, he actually chooses to spend his time here. <laughs> Thank you for the privilege of participating. Um, and I'm, uh, ex I'm a little surprised, but uh, I'm pleasantly surprised that uh, people took time out of their day to want to think about the context of doing well and doing good. Um, that's what I'd like to think. But I also wonder, and I'm, I'm actually kind of uh, curious, uh, I suspect there's a fair amount of Weather Channel folks here in the audience tonight. Now, I don't mean like you know the people who want to know what's going to happen tomorrow in Boston. 
<clears throat> but I predict, you know, I have the sense, looking at this crowd, that you're the kind of folks that tune in the Weather Channel when there's news of hurricanes, right? And it's not because you like storms. It's because you really want to know, you want to see that poor, demented reporter standing right there in the, in the, in the weather. You want to see the, you know, the wind blowing, and you want to see the hail finding. Let's see if this sucker survives, right? That you, there is a little schadenfreude in this group. I, there is. There's a, I want to see what it's like to be, you know, someone dumb enough at this moment to be the CEO in a, of a publicly traded company in the global economy. Like, let, let's, see, let's see what pain looks like here at all. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a, a weather report live from the, not from the eye of the storm. I, we, you know, I don't know if I'll live to see the eye of the storm from right in the midst of this storm um, because the CEO is squirming in the face of an economic hurricane. Uh, so Len, Professor, Professor, President Schlesinger, uh, can I call you Len? You can call me President. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> El Presidente said, uh, the question is, what do you do? And that's the right question, right? That, and that's what I actually want to spend a minute on. Because uh, if you look around, right, consumers have stopped spending. It's, even though the press says it, this time it's actually true. The crisis of confidence that's paralyzing financial markets is getting worse, not better. Uh, every industry, including ours, is melting down, like the Wicked Witch, you know, I'm melting. Really, it's falling apart. It, it, we got a Treasury Secretary who doesn't pay his own taxes. We got a vindictive Congress that thinks it can manage the marketplace better than the marketplace. We got bailouts for the venal and the inept and financial markets that signal clearly that the worst is still in front of us. If you look at Treasuries, if you look at any indices, look forward, the marketplace, whoever these geniuses are, uh, they are telling us that it's going to get worse before it gets better. This is a forecast for super stormy weather. So let's go live to Olin and see how CEOs play in a real storm. Well, if you take a look at the weather at good old Camp Timberland, which is uh, where I work for a living, uh, this is in fact one serious storm, right? If you look at our stock, uh, our market cap today is in the range of $700 million. That's down from $2 billion. Um, that's not good, right? That's, it, I know, right, I, I know there are uh, engineering people here who really know numbers, but $2 billion big, 700 smaller, not great if you're the guy presiding over that little slide. Revenues are also down, profits too. In our industry, the entire conversation is about surviving. And it's not, uh, it's not hyperbolic conversation about survival. It's drop-dead serious people clearing out their desk conversation about survival. Macy's cut 10,000 employees in one phone call. Macy's is a big customer at Timberland. They have a West Coast division. Uh, I know there's people calling them for years and years. It's never fun to go out to San Francisco and get yelled at by these guys. You can go out to San Francisco and get yelled at, but not by Macy's anymore because their chairman picked the phone up on Monday morning for the Monday morning retail call and said, we're closing the West Coast. 10,000 people in one phone call. Right? Nike's announced proactive restructuring, which means they're cutting people's jobs. Um, uh, Reebok just fired most of their U.S. employees, and great brands, I mean brands that I admire, like Quicksilver is an example of a brand I admire, they're on bankruptcy watch. The stock was at 100, it's at about a dollar today. They have a billion and a half dollars in debt, and if you have debt, you have problems, right? So from, from a, a view of what's it like operationally, I can't overstate it. I'm not sure I can efficiently state it. It's just uh, be a Dad, bad. So that's the scene around us, and it, it appears uh, the storm is uh, borderline biblical from an economic perspective. But I keep telling the people that I work with, I have 5,000 uh, of my closest colleagues at Timberland, that uh, we don't make an economy, and we don't control the weather, and we're not accountable for the choices that other people make. But we are responsible for our own choices, and we will be held accountable not for the circumstances that we find, but for the choices we make in the faces of the circumstances that are presented to us. And, you know, I love the... Uh, people say that crisis builds character, but I, I don't know. I've been doing this for 25 years, and I don't think that's right. I don't think crisis builds character. I think crisis reveals character. So I want to tell you a little bit about 2009 at Timberland through the lens, uh, through the perspective of a third generation guy. I'm a, I, my grandfather started the company. My dad built it into the brand that it is, and it's my job to either blow it or, or, or steward it to, the, to safer hands uh, down the line. And as a shareholder, right, our family is still a principal shareholder of the company. It's a publicly traded company, but all my wealth is tied up in the company, right? So I'm not playing with other people's chips. I'm an owner manager, right? When the stock goes down, so does my wealth, directly and, and, and unambiguously. So I get nothing, there's no safe harbor for me in, in an economic sense either. And in, more important than either of those two things, we got 112 years between my grandfather, my dad, and me, soaked into a, you know, 
I don't know what you talk about at your family holidays. Unfortunately, sometimes we still talk about, my mother criticizes the ads and my dad has product ideas. We talk about boots, that's what we do. It, it's, uh, no, it's not exciting, ask my wife, but that's, that's true, like 112 years of our life tied up in this. So um, I just finished rereading Budenbrooks. I, I was a uh, literature major at Brown, uh, and I read Budenbrooks when I was a young guy. Budenbrooks is Thomas Mann, it's a 1904, 1905 novel about a family business. Uh, through the generations, and in the end it goes poof. Poof is a technical term, it means it disappeared, it doesn't turn out so good. So I read it the first time, it was great literature, I read it the second time, and I have to tell you, <clears throat> I didn't sleep so great. So um, uh, here, here we sit. 2009, I can't manage the economy or the weather, but I'm accountable for the choices that I make, just like you are, right? 2009 is going to be a very difficult year financially for the industry and for our company. No great insight there, right? But it's also going to be an historic year for Timberland in terms of our enduring 30-plus year history of aspiring to earn our profits responsibly and sustainably. I say that boldly, uh, but I say that concretely. At a time when you, when you, as a consumer or as a shareholder, might be willing to excuse a giant step back from our stated mission of commerce and justice, our agenda remains centered in the belief that commerce and justice are not antithetical notions. That the job of the CEO is to deliver the quarter, right? we need to take care of the shareholder, even delight the shareholder, and at the same time, to assure the basic human rights of all in the value chain globally. And at the same time, to convene the power and innovation of citizen service in the communities where we work and live. And at the same time, to take concrete steps to minimize the environmental impact of our value chain, from raw materials through to retail. Did anybody here read the Wall Street Journal today? Yeah, you did. Of course you did. Uh, th it's, too, it's too beautiful, right? If you open up the Wall Street, you don't have to open it. Just the front page of the Wall Street Journal in the middle at the bottom, with all this sort of that quirky article. Okay, everybody's had dinner, right? This article is about sheep and methane, right? And it's about global warming. And it's about scientists, people who, whose passion leads them to try and alter the diet of sheep so that they will, you'll forgive me, be a little less flatulent. Because in the context of global warming, right, you look at Timberland's supply chain. Everything that we can do to impact sustainable, uh, about carbon emissions in our value chain, everything we can do. Reduce transpor tra transportation, pack the shoes differently, all is interesting, right? The single biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions in Timberland's value chain is the cow in the field munching the grass. So uh, you want to run a sustainable enterprise? I can't, I, you want to survive? That's one question. You want to run a sustainable enterprise? So sh what should we be focused on in 2009? Right? Cows and their methane moment, or moments, or uh, our operating expense ratio relative to our revenues? And the answer I assert to you, I hope not irrationally, is yes. Right? We have to worry about both in times of crisis, because all times are times of crisis. This one is an economic external crisis, but you either live your values or you talk about your values. We'll see. So I could tell you in 2009, we could talk about uh, investments we're making in citizen service or about the next level of engagement that we're undertaking in terms of human rights in the factories, or I could show you the commitments we're making in terms of transparency. It's a big deal, uh, an evolving, fast-paced big deal about how to have conversation with stakeholders. Right? Wall Street has a very, very powerful syntax. It's usually in letters, EBITDA, ROI. These are, these are, short -term, these are short, uh, shorthand language that allows an analyst to say, how's the company doing financially? Well, the activist community has gone from uh, burn down the house, let me throw a brick through the window, right? you know, uh, a form of activism, to a different kind of engagement, which says, no, I'm actually going to hold you accountable. We're going to create a syntax of accountability, and there are very few companies in our industry, but there are some that are starting to engage in this notion of transparent conversation with activists. So every 90 days, I host a phone call of you know, uh, the Wall Street folks. The CFO uh, re repeats in grinding detail uh, the poor results that preceded the last 90 days. Uh, Wall Street listens politely. I go on for about six minutes, which is about all they'll take, hear, uh, to hear about strategy, about boot brand and belief, and then they power us with questions, right? You know, tell us about foreign exchange and stuff like that. But then two days later, now, I host a phone call with activists. 
uh, on a global basis. And if we get 50 people from Wall Street, we get 150 people comfortably on the activist conversation to have a conversation about global warming, or have a conversation about human rights, or have a conversation about citizen service. So there's a wild, fast-growing industry called I'll hold you accountable. There's not yet a great language. It's still very qualitative, but it, it starts to exist. We could talk about it, but I'm not going to. I want to instead talk tonight for the next few minutes, and then please ask hard questions, uh, or, or please have something to say about this makes no sense at all, because this isn't, um, this isn't self-aggrandizing. I'm dead serious. I'm a third generation guy, and I, I don't have any particular passion to see my kids involved in the business, but I, uh, I have a big responsibility of 5,000 people at Timberland. And right now, when you make a mistake, people pack up their cube and they go home to their families. Right? And they don't have great alternatives. And so when you hear weakness in the rhetoric and you hear flab in the argument, it would be a great kindness for you to expose it and attack it. Because then I could go back to work tomorrow and make commerce and justice come a little bit closer to true. So a few quick words about earth keeping and then you, then you have to help me sharpen my game, please. Earth keeping. Earth keeping at Timberland is a fundamental commitment to make ours a sustainable business at every level. Sustainable in terms of our products, in terms of our value chain. And by value chain, I mean like there's a cow and then there's a pair of shoes coming off the shelf at a retail store. That's our value chain. <clears throat> I meant to say that's our value chain. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. It's tough being old. <laughs> so here I am. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm not casual. I'm just afraid I'm going to fall over. I haven't <laughs> not a lot of sleep last night. Preparing for this group of... of uh, Incredulous faces. Okay, look, earth, earth, earth keeping, sustainability in terms of products, value chain, and in consumer relationships. Earth keeping is both about the next 90 days. Publicly traded company, you gotta, you gotta show them what you did every 90 days and be held accountable for it. It's also about the next generation. Not my kids, but the impacts of next generation. Because it's real. Someone loses their job today, you don't know what the derivative effect is for their family. But it's real. Earth keeper products sell. That is cool. Earthkeeper products sell globally. In the fourth quarter, Timberland's a calendar year company. Fourth quarter, the world came to an end. Wham, stopped, right? But in Japan, two out of the five best selling products were Earthkeeper products. In, in Europe, in our retail stores, 15% of our sales on 10% of our inventory. That's good. Like, you, you, you made that particular part of the inventory work harder than you'd expect, it over indexed. That's a good result. And in the United States, this saturated, bombarded marketplace, Earthkeeper is still best selling stuff. Earthkeeper products sell because they require the best we can do. This is, that's, a, that's the best phrase that I came up with in the whole darn speech. All right, I'm going to tell you what I mean by it. They, are, they sell because they require the best we can do, which is exactly the thesis of commerce and justice. There is no room in commerce and justice for good intentions. You don't get paid for good intentions. You don't get credit for good intentions. You have to have good intentions. But if you don't execute, it don't matter. Right? The, the, the thesis of doing well and doing good is active verbs. Right? And if there was ever a time where there's, there ain't no room for screwing up, uh, I don't think there ever was any room, but there's, there's hyper no room. I don't know if that was good English. But there ain't no room right now, because that smells imperfect, and you lost my attention. Right? Earthkeeper sells because the best they require the best we can do. They're made with recycled materials. Timberland's found a way to turn soda bottles into the linings for shoes and the laces for shoes. We found ways to replace factory farm cotton with all the herbicides and pesticides per square hectare that that consumes with organic cotton canvas for these boots. Really cool, right? And we found exclusively, in partnership with a Malaysian nut job, introduced to me by the former President of the United States, President Clinton, there's exactly all you need to know about the shoe business. I got President Clinton on the phone saying, you need to talk to a Malaysian guy whose father invented a thing where you pour it on a, a tire in a landfill and it turns into rubber you can put on the sole of your shoes. Green rubber. I'm thinking, it's just not the way it used to be. Right? It used to be a purchasing agent calling someone and saying, I need more rubber for my, for my shoes. Right? You negotiate a price. That was the drama. Now you've got to negotiate Secret Service before you can get to, to meet the President. To talk. It's fantastic. But this fall, Fall 2009, when the world's like that, <laughs> let me hide. I did that on purpose. <laughs> Let's hide, right? Timberland is introducing green rubber exclusively. And Beth, guess what? No one cares. No one cares at all, right? Because it's recycled. The lining is made out of a soda bottle. That's good. Right? The lace used to be a Fanta thing. Terrific. No, no but you know, the sole on the shoe used to be an abandoned tire in a landfill. Wonderful, right? Now, if the conversation is, I got a great looking product at a spectacular price, 
available at the store that you happen to be shopping at in the size that you want at a price that you're willing to pay, and then all the rest of that's true, I'll buy one. Maybe. Maybe. That is what Earth Keepers, and the fact that Earth Keepers selling to me is spectacular. Right? It's beautiful and handsome. It's powerful and productive. It's responsible. It's a synthetic thing. It, it's, it's a th synthesis where concept meets reality, and people say, yeah, I'll buy that. That's exciting. Good, I can skip that. Um, uh, this year, oh yeah, wait, uh, uh, folks, in the midst of the storm, Earthkeeper product is working. Values and value are selling, or value and values, I don't know. Consumers don't buy values, they come, they come with an I, right? Nobody marries on the basis of a resume, right? Nobody, right? Maybe in arranged worlds they did, I don't know, but I can tell you, right, there's a lot of selling involved. I can speak from my own limited experience. There's a lot of selling, right? And, it, the, and when you're in the fashion business, the selling is aesthetic, right? Virtue isn't necessarily beautiful. It isn't even necessarily evident. You can't tell by looking. I can, you can't, right? Whether uh, the shirt that, that, that my friend in the front wearing here, this cotton shirt, which is a very nice nubby kind of cotton, it's very nice, right? Textured. Organic cotton or factory farmed? Do you know, do you care? Well, if I asked you intellectually, do you care? You'd say, Look, we're sophisticated. We probably care, right? Yeah, right answer, you care. And if I asked you, which one do you prefer, organic cotton or factory farm cotton, say, hey, that doesn't sound like a difficult question. Organic sounds better. I've been to Whole Foods. The apples look funny, but they, and they cost more, but they're good for you, right? I don't know exactly. What, and, you, and some of you are scientists, but you still don't really know what organic means. It's okay, because the people who are selling it to you don't know either, right? But they know that organic is better than factory farm, and it's true about cotton, too because organic cotton consumes less herbicide and pesticide per square hectare. That's a great term, hectare. It, I don't know what it means. It's a space thing, right? Then, <laughs> I'm a boot maker, folks. I, I have a quarter of an acre in Newton. That's what I know about space. Uh, but a, per square hectare, less is better than more, right? Yeah, but there's all sorts of complexities about it. And by the way, no one ever bought an ugly looking, expensive cotton shirt because it was made out of organic cotton. Earthkeeper gets no pass on that. If you want to succeed with EarthKeeper, you've got to do it all. OK. Um, while we are working hard to make EarthKeeper footwear come alive and work, I got the, skunks, the skunk works at Timberland, uh, I got, which is whoever happens to be walking by in the hall and didn't look away fast enough, then they're on the skunk works team. There's some guy walking, I'm going, I'm not looking at him, because I know what he's going to ask. They don't know what I'm going to ask, but they know they're going to get this. Hey, what do you, I, I ask people in the hallway. You think you have a strange day? I could stop you and ask you, what do you do with your t-shirt when you're finished with it? And the guy's like, what? I said, what do you do with your t-shirt when you're finished with it? I wash it. I said, no, finished, finished. It's done. Uh, the, you know, the, the very adept, quick ones who've learned how to deal with me say, I give it away, right? Because that sounds like a socially uh, responsible thing to do. Other people are like, I don't know. I throw it out. Whoa, okay, you're on the team. What's the team? I want to recycle cotton t-shirts. Now, cotton is a long staple. Long, the t-shirt you wear, the, the Abercrombie and Fitch uh, thing that you wear in there is long staple cotton, which is like feels good, right? You, you heard that, the cotton, that, that good feeling thing, right? When you recycle it, it becomes short staple. We're going to finish this technical demonstration because I have no skill on this point except short doesn't feel good, long does feel good. So you can't take a long staple thing and just churn it up and make it into a short one. So what do you do with it? You know the tons of of cotton clothing that go into the landfill every year? Right, if you want to be an earth keeper, if you want earth keeping to pervade everything that you do, you have to have a group of nutty people at Timberland uh, who volunteer, kind of, to work on a project to recycle cotton t-shirts. And they're working on some spectacular ideas, and maybe you'll ask them about it, and if you do, I'll tell you about them. Anyways, um, sustainability needs to work at every level of our product line. Earth keeping is a lonely passion, but I also have recognized, much to my chagrin, that it can't be a solitary exercise. If you really want to be about sustainability, right? L listen to this awkward dance. I don't know what goes on Saturday night here, but in the corporate world on Saturday night, one CEO goes over here, the other CEO goes there, you go to a cocktail party, whatever you do on Saturday night. Not I. If you want to do earth keeping, you have to engage in the awful, uncomfortable dance of hanging out with people that aren't like you. So for example, you have to hang out with government people. You have to have a conversation. Like, so if Timberland wants to build a solar array, which we did want to do in California, the great state thereof, right, you've got to hang out with the government because 
uh, it, it requires cooperation and collaboration. So that's like an awkward thing. Those pictures are always kind of tense, right? You're standing out with a governor, right? That's okay. It, it, maybe because you like them, maybe because you don't like them, just you know that this isn't the way it's usually, that's not the way they did it at, at, at business school when I went back in the 1900s, right? You would, business over here, government over there. It gets nastier, right? If you really want to be sustainable, you have to talk to, engage with, okay, we'll limit this breaking bread thing, but you really got to get up close to these NGOs. You know, they, they look different, they smell different, they sure as heck talk different. But if you want to think about cotton t-shirts, we can have geniuses at Timberland to figure out technically maybe how to make long staple into short staple, but that's not the answer, right? That, that, that may not be the answer. So how do you do it? We've got a group called TRAID, T-R-A-I-D, in the UK. And they are an environmental group, an NGO, and they want to save the world. But in the UK, there's a phenomenon that want to save the world doesn't mean you can't open a retail store on the high street and sell for profit. And so here's the deal. This is really kind of cool, right? People come into a Timberland store on, let's say, um, Bond Street, and they bring in their old stuff, and we give them some, I don't know, uh, either we give them an economic sense to buy something else, we just take the stuff and say thank you. Then we give it to trade, T-R-A-I-D. They wash it, they clean it, and they sell it into the market as used stuff, but for a profit, and they take that profit, and then they invest in environmental curriculum for young kids. That's their, that's their passion. It, it, you can imagine Timberland's retail team, who can barely keep the lights on right now. That's how bad it is at retail. In our own retail store, thinking, I gotta go work with the, 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 those save the tree types who don't, look, we're not good enough at retail to start with, and now we're gonna go help people who have no idea how to do retail? And I think, right. Yeah, so off you go, because how else are we going to find a way to close a loop if we don't have conversations with the government, with the NGOs, and here's where it gets nasty. This is the stuff you suspect the CEOs anyways, right? We talk to our competitors. We collude. We collaborate to dominate world markets, right? So Timberland and Nike whew, spend time together. You have to, because we don't always manufacture in our own factories. We have our own factories. Nike doesn't. Nike is the biggest footwear guy on earth. Right? And so if you want to get David Tsai's attention, David Tsai is the, the, I think he's the third generation of his family that runs the largest shoe manufacturing company on earth called Pao Chen. He's a Taiwanese Chinese guy with factories in China and in Vietnam and other places. He's Nike's biggest supplier. He's a big supplier to Timberland too, and so I marched in there to have a big conversation about renewable energy. And he's a very polite guy. So I got 10 minutes and then I got tossed. Right? If you want to actually influence the, uh, the energy policy in an industry like ours, you actually got to go hang out, not just the government. That looks now, it's good. That, there's a picture you can show your kids. There's me with the governor. The NGO thing eh, is deniability. They don't want a picture with you anyway, so you're safe, right? No pictures. But how about with your competitors? The board loves that. Where's Jeff? He's hanging out with the Nike guys, right? That's, is that the way to survive and, and compete in the world right now? Well, if earthkeeping is something you do, no. But if earthkeeping is something you are about, the answer is yes. Awkward collaboration across sectors in civic society. One last thing about earthkeeping, and then the great conclusion. You getting ready with your hard questions? If they're really hard, I'm going to stretch this, so it's okay. I've got plenty of things to read you. Earthkeeping also means engaging with consumers. And so I will just tell you two things. One that you'll get, it's going to make me narrowly hit for about one second. One second. This is not that part. One is nutrition labels, right? Anybody buying packaged food without a label on it? No way. Right? You go to the UK, it says different things, but there's a nutrition label. Calories, it may say kilocalories, but okay, you get your engineers, some of you can convert them anyways. It's just, it, but there's a number that says more or less, whatever, toxin, healthy, good, whatever. You got it, right? No one's going to buy a Snickers bar without a nutrition label. But nobody asks for a nutrition label on fashion. Well, the food goes in you, but the fashion goes on you, right? And so, I don't know. I was having one of those uh, conversations with myself. One of my, I am my favorite correspondent with myself. And, and honestly, I rarely get the kind of disagreement, rarely, that I get in, in the corporate halls at Timberland. Generally, I get a consensus after a conversation with myself. And I said, uh, I, was sent, I was sent to Whole Foods to buy organic apples. And actually, there was not much disclosure. Right? I, I was instructed to do it. I was doing what I was told. But I got to keep myself busy while I'm doing what I was told. And I thought, well, somebody tell me the story about organic apples. And it said, they are organic. But it's like, OK, give me more. It's the, it's the recessive engineer in me. I wanted more information. And it wasn't there. And then I got to thinking about, um, 
activists in our industry spend a long time chasing Nike. I don't mean to pick on Nike in this sense. I have respect for many of the things that they do. And Nike took the view, I won't tell you where I manufacture the shoes. The activist said, I know what the names of the factories. Nike said, I won't tell you, which is a hysterical. It would be, that would be like a Buster Keaton film back in the silent movie thing. Because it would have, if the activists had just raised their head up for about one second, you, you didn't need Nike to tell you where the factories are. Where do you hide a factory that can make 40 million pairs of shoes? <laughs> Must be a state secret, right? It would take them about 30 seconds of different thinking for the activists to find it. But they had a five-year debate in our industry. Nike's saying, you know, give them the Heisman. Not going to tell you, right? And so, and the activists saying, but you have to tell us. And so we thought, uh, before they ask us questions that we don't want to answer, maybe we should be preemptive about answering the questions. So we, I decided, our general counsel loved this, right? She said, uh, you'll go to jail. And I said, um, there's, that, there's parts of that that appeal to me, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> there are. I mean, as long as I could choose the reading list, there's, there's a part of me that thinks it would beat the hell out of my day job. But I, I said, <laughs> Oh, you thought I was making this crap up about an economic storm and businesses going out of business and people hanging on for dear? I'm not making it up. I, I'm not making it up. I know the name of every single person who's lost their job at Timberland since 2007. There's 269 of them. And uh, there's 5,000 people at Timberland. And don't tell me the ratio is we've done a good job of conserving jobs. I have 269 souls that I'm responsible for them losing their job. And so sometimes uh, a solitary cell with a book is very appealing, right? And so. Um, what was I telling you about? Oh, the nutrition label. I said to Danette, who's our general counsel, look, we just let's do this. Make sure I don't go to jail because, uh, yeah, it's just not a good thing. But I want to put on the label the name of the factory we manufacture at. I want to put on the label um, incidents of child labor in the, in the value chain at Timberland in a given year. I want to put something about renewable energy, and I want to put something about community service hours served, and something about uh, toxins. And we, it, it's funny, um, a third generation guy, my grandfather's a very direct dude. My dad is a, ran our factories and he's also, he can tell you exactly what he's thinking. It doesn't, doesn't take a big preamble or a speech. He's like, boom. And I'm a watered down third generation guy. They, they cut the blood pretty thin by this point. So I, I usually kind of go like this. I don't believe in very much. But what I believe in, it turns out, I'll really fight for. And so I ran into the bureaucracy of well-intended people too much saying, you can't do this. And so I just went ahead and did it. And I, I did the same with the t-shirt thing. I found two people, said, give me a hand. We designed it, we started putting on shoe boxes. And so we have a, a nutrition label on every one of our shoe boxes that tells you the name of the factory and child labor. And by the way, that's a big old bagel, right? The zero. But, that, but um, everybody knows in management what you measure is what you get, right? And so if you put a standard on a shoe box that says 5% of the energy used to manufacture Timberland products is from renewable energy, which is true, by the way, 5%. Now, that, she pointed out to me, that says that 95% is not renewable. I said, you're right, someday we'll get our colleagues in industry and our competitors to adopt a label before the government does it, because when the government does it, with due respect and deep respect and great humility, they'll screw it up, right? <laughs> they will. They will. Uh, I am, I'm the proudest American citizen in the room. I don't claim that in adversarial well. I'm very proud to be a, uh, a citizen of the greatest democracy on earth, but uh, I have... I have, you have, I have, we encounter daily the limits uh, of civic society's collaboration. And our industry should be pungent and quick, and we should move not to prevent the government from uh, providing information to consumers, but because we understand better our process than anybody else does. And if we would act with justice, we could tell people the truth instead of the watered down, uh, mediocre middle class standard, which will eventually be adopted, which will tell consumers nothing and give the CEO a chance to hide, which she doesn't really need. Right? She shouldn't have a chance to hide behind. Right? So we've put a label out there. We've gone to every one of our competitors and said, with the technology we've paid for, you may have for free. You don't have to call it Timberland's label. You can call it the Nike standard. I don't care what you call it. Just put it on your shoebox. So that at Nordstrom, when the box comes out, because at Nordstrom, um, you've got to bring out two pairs. If you go in and ask for a pair of boat shoes and the sales associate only brings you out one, he'll get fired. They've got to bring out a boat shoe and a boot. Right? They've got to try to sell you two things, and usually two different brands. And they always bring the shoe box out, and on the box it says, you know, size 9 clod hopper. Or it's got a little nutrition label that tells you all the stuff that nobody else talks about. And I'm dying for people to ask the question, why does this one have it and this one doesn't have it? And so it's lonely, but it's, it's um, I don't know, we're at the tipping point. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, it, does this sound too irrational? Now, I don't mean do I sound irrational, because that can, I can read from your faces. I want to know, does, does this strategy, does this uh, approach to managing in the context of Honest to goodness, 270 people lost their jobs in, in, uh, since 2007 at Timberland. This sounds to you like the way to build a brand forward. Um, 
I'm trying to portray commerce and justice during an economic hurricane. I'm trying to assert this is sound strategy, and I'm trying to assert this is a way forward that makes sense. I believe the crisis is a good time to sort out the difference between values and beliefs and trends in fashion. I hate the notion of fashion. That's my industry, but I hate it. Blue is still blue. I don't care what this year's blue is. It's still blue, right? But by changing this year's blue, there must be some bar in Milan where everybody gets together and says, let's change the blue. And that means things get thrown out and things get created and waste gets perpetuated and nobody needs the new blue. And then it's funny, the, the one positive consumer outcome of this is I think people are waking up to that. Right? Saks Fifth Avenue burned designer stuff the, the Friday before Thanksgiving last year. I don't mean with a match, but they put it in the middle of the floor on the first floor and they gave the stuff away. And people walked in and said, it's, it doesn't matter what brand it is, it's hoochie poochie and Gucci, right? And it, oh, yeah. and then I saw, I was there, I saw people thinking, this was 4,000 bucks? It's a handbag. Right, that I carry not even that much stuff in. It's a small handbag. And I was, a minute ago, a minute ago, it was a $4,000 must have. And now it's a $3,000 small leather bag that will hold not as much as my um, North Face backpack would, would carry, which is a lot less money. And so if there's anything positive, I think maybe we puncture this myth of, of nuttiness about the new blue. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Crisis, I think, is a good time to sort out the difference between what you believe and what's trendy. I'm a third generation guy. I'm a principal shareholder. I eat my own cooking. Right? One of the retailers in our space said to me once, I went down to sell him something. His name is Alex Dillard at Dillard's. He said, uh, here comes my southern accent. I buy anything you're selling, Jeff. And I said, why? He said, because if it's wrong, you're going to have to fix it. And uh, he said, his store is called Dillard's Department Store, right? So he understood this. He's a third generation guy too, right? So I can spout all day long. I can be self-indulgent with my rhetoric, but I get to eat my own cooking. Crisis is a good editor. Only the essentials maintained in a time as spare as this. Sustainability is a corporate value, good for the shareholder. You know how they say hunters are the best environmentalists because if you take away the forest, they got no place to do their thing? Well, bootmakers are frugal by, by definition. Finding a way to make a boot with fewer parts is good business, right? It lowers costs and improves quality. It also has a huge environmental impact. Using solar heat for hot water in the Dominican Republic or wind turbines at our factory to power the factory saves us money in operating terms. It takes capital up front, but if you take the view we have zero debt in our balance sheet, because I may not appear to you the most conservative guy you'll ever meet, but in, in terms of balance sheet, uh, I, I, am, I, I got an enviable track record relative to the venal, right? I, I just, I, I never met a debt I don't want to have. And so we can afford to make investments in things like solar arrays, which means on an operating cost basis, our per kilowatt price of energy in the Dominican Republic is way lower, way lower than dirty energy. I acknowledge the capital cost, but I'm telling you on an operating basis, it's way lower. Um, and then I get, I get perplexed because people say sustainability, you look like all those green nut job guys, and I think, uh-huh. And everybody looks, what is he looking at? Looking at the light bulbs. What CEO in America is so stupid as to leave cost on the table? You know the payback on switching from uh, high energy halogen to high wattage, low ballast lights is less than six months? I mean, is there a CEO in America that doesn't want to change the light bulbs and save a buck? So, so earth keeping, right? It can be lofty, weird stuff like recycle a t-shirt. It could be change the light bulb. Real value gets created in discontinuous time. For 35 years of brand building, commerce and justice is how we lived. We began making boots in a mill in New Hampshire nearly 40 years ago. We built the best boot we could, we guaranteed it for life, and we took responsibility for the consequences. We forged a community in our factory, we worked hard, we played fair, and we built trust with consumers. We built trust and we learned how to build trust, even in crisis, or maybe even especially in crisis. Consumers don't want to be activists. They'll not buy ugly and expensive but virtuous. They won't support your brand simply because you do good things in the community. In fact, if you ask consumers, they expect that kind of behavior from their neighbors, and they don't understand why all businesses don't do good as a matter of course. They don't get it, and they shouldn't. Consumers are hard, but they're fair. All things being equal, if your boot's the right price and the right look at the right store at the right time, and if you can tell an authentic, credible story of boot brand and belief, well, under those circumstances, the consumer will buy your Earth Keeper boot over the other guy's boot. It's as simple as that. That's our story, and we're sticking to it even in a storm as lethal as the one we're in right now. Our strategy is simple and clear. We say, commerce and justice beats a bad storm. We say, boot brand and belief is the way we're gonna win. Reporting from the storm, live in Olin Auditorium, this is Jeff. Now, 
That's me. I, yeah, I want to know. Yeah. <laughs>